So <clears throat> when Chris asked me to speak on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, I thought, that's amazing. That is my favorite all-time verse. Uh, as, as a baby Christian, I saw this scripture almost 50 years ago, and I thought, wow, that is it. And I imagine I have preached more sermons from this context than any other one in the Bible. And I've always preached about our love for Jesus. And, and we read it, it says, for Christ's love compels us. Because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And so I'd been praying about the message and getting ready. And then I, it struck me, you know what? I don't ever focus on his love for us. And that's really the foundation of the verse. The love of Christ compels us. I, I have read this verse in, in a lot of versions. The Revised Standard Version says the love of Christ controls us. The Old King James Version says the love of Christ constraineth us. And the new one says the love of Christ constrains us. Uh, there's a newer version that says the love of Christ leaves us no choice. And, and maybe my favorite is the old J.B. Phillips translation that says, the love of Christ is the spring of our every action. Wow. The love of Christ is the spring of our every action. <clears throat> so the word compel, and I, I looked this up in several different dictionaries, and it means to be so inspired or motivated that we overcome resistance. I thought, wow, that's amazing because Satan is continually resisting us. He resists us when we strive to do something right. He provides resistance when we want to say no to something that we don't want to do. And he's continually resisting us. In fact, uh, his name means opponent. Uh, he is our opponent. And... Uh, the love of Christ compels us to overcome. Amen. Satan is, a, is the opponent that we need. Uh, <clears throat> University of Georgia just won an amazing championship, national championship in football. And what made it so amazing is that they had to beat the juggernaut University of Alabama tied. I mean, they... What an amazing football program. Amazing. I mean, it seems like they win it every other year, doesn't it? Or two out of three years even that Alabama wins that championship. And finally, the University of Georgia won. And, and what made it so special, again, is because they had beaten such an incredible opponent. Satan provides us with serious opposition. And that's why our victories in Jesus are so sweet. They are so amazing. When, when we pray and God helps us to overcome that temptation, or we pray and God helps us to overcome that fear in our life, we pray and God helps us to change yeah. something in our lives, something that's always been there, yeah. <clears throat> but really needs to change for us to be more like Jesus. And so the love of Christ compels us. It constrains us. It controls us. It leaves us no choice. It is the spring of our every action. But here's the other side, and that is that Jesus' love for us compels him. His love for you is compelling. It compelled him to do all that he did for you. And so we're going to just, just study a little bit about what he does for us. In Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5b says, To him who loves us 
and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. To him who loves us. In John chapter 17. Isn't it amazing to be loved? There, there are a few people on this planet who really, who really do love me. It's, it's a short list. Okay? It's longer than I deserve, but it's a pretty short list. Those people are very dear to me. They are very, very special to me. And with God's help, I believe I'll do anything. So to know that Jesus loves you, incredible. That he loves you personally, just amazing. In John 17, verse 18, Jesus is is praying here for us. And he says in, in verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus lived for you. He came here on this earth to live for you, to live a sanctified life. The word sanctified means holy. And if, if you speak Spanish and you're familiar with the word santo, yeah. the word holy, yeah. or one who is a saint, uh, uh, sanctified, santificado, okay, to be holy. Jesus had to be holy when he was here. He had to be, he had to be separate in his heart from sin. Now, he had to love sinners, and so he spent time with tax collectors and sinners, and he, and he was persecuted by religious people of the day for that. But he could not allow any sin into his own heart or into his own mind or life. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that he was tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Why was that? Jesus was living for you so that he could set you the perfect example. Jesus said, I have lived a sanctified life so that they might be sanctified. Okay, so that we too can live holy lives. And so Jesus lived for you. <clears throat> In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we read that Jesus chose you. 1 Peter 2, 9, but you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you'd not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Isn't it special to be chosen? I have not been chosen for many things. I went out for my basketball team every year. And, and the coach would say, on next Monday morning, there'll be a list of all the people who made the team. And I would go look on that list, and I didn't see my name on there, and i go, okay, well, let me start at the bottom and, my, and work my way back up. <laughs> go, no, it's not on there. There's got to be some mistake. I'm not on the basketball team. You know, and I, can, and I can shoot set shots without any rotation, you know, maybe even... Top spin, <laughs> okay, and guys who play realize you're supposed to put back spin, okay, and you're not supposed to shoot set shots, you're supposed to jump when you shoot, okay, my, my top spin set shot didn't impress the coach, you know, <clears throat> I ran for, I ran for office in school several times, I was never chosen, you know, I could go through a litany of things for which I was not chosen, but God chose me. Isn't that amazing? He chose you. He himself chose you. Amen. He goes, Look, I don't care what, you know, others might have overlooked you. You know, they messed up. Ah. I see you. Right. I see you. I know you. Yeah. I love you. I choose you. 
<clears throat> we're going to be family. Amen. And we're going to be partners. Come on. And so Jesus <clears throat> lived for you. He chose you. And you think about all the things that work together in your life to bring you to him. You see how he was working. Yeah. Don't you? I see him working through, through my grandmothers. I see him working through my mom. I see him working... You know, just through different people and circumstances. And, and I thank him for those people and those things that happened and things that I wanted to happen that didn't. But were they to have happened, I probably wouldn't have become a Christian. Yeah. And just all of his provisions is just his providence in our lives. Yeah. Truly, truly, yeah. he has chosen us. In Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 10. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. And Jesus is the pioneer of our salvation. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I'll declare your name to my brothers and sisters. and the assembly, I'll sing your praises. And again, I'll put my trust in him. And again, he says, here I am. And the children God has given me. He's your brother. I don't have a physical brother, but I have a brother in Christ. And through him, I have, I have brothers in Christ. <clears throat> he is family with you. In Ephesians chapter 1, we're told that the reason that God created the universe was so that he might lavishly bestow his love on us. Yeah. It says, as his adopted sons and daughters through Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> part of what happens for you to become a child of God is that when you repent and you're baptized into Christ, you become his brother or sister, and therefore you become God's son or daughter. God adopted you through Jesus. <clears throat> He's your brother. <clears throat> In John chapter 10, John chapter 10 and verse 10, he is your shepherd. He is your shepherd. And you think about the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. Yeah. And Jesus is your shepherd. Yeah. <clears throat> the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life. For the sheep. You see, he lived for you and he died for you. So, <clears throat> my grandfather many years ago bought some land and, and it has some cows on it, and, and some of that land still belongs to the family, and there's still some cows there. And we have our, we call him our cow guy, Artie. And Artie is like the shepherd of those cows, and the cows love Artie. This is pretty interesting to see, cow, see Artie walk out into the pasture, and he'll walk out upwind of the cattle so they can smell him, okay? They know the smell of Artie, okay? And they know his voice, and they come to Artie, and they crowd around him. And, and, and if he's there in his truck, this is pretty interesting, They'll come up and they'll press their noses against the truck window. Okay, yeah, and you'll see cow snot running right down the window there. <laughs> Just being honest, okay. But, I mean, literally, they do that. They press their noses right on his windows of his truck there, okay. <clears throat> I drove down on, on Monday, and I see Artie over in the pens, and he's got a horse there. And the horse, somehow, it injured its forelegs. And Artie is putting medicinal salve on the horse's forelegs. He's, he is a good shepherd. He's an amazing shepherd. 
Okay, Jesus is your shepherd. He takes care of you. He provides you with, with uh, pure running water and green pastures, and he protects you though you walk in the valley of the shadow of death. He protects you and me from things we don't even know about because of temptations that would have been too great for us or circumstances that would have been too damaging for us. And he is protecting. He's our shepherd. He's our brother. He lived for us. He died for us. As, again, as Carmen shared in communion. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 28. Come on, bro. Matthew chapter 28. Verse 18. This is after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. I don't like loneliness. I don't like to be lonely. And I don't like to be left out. <clears throat> It's tough for me to go to work on Monday or go to school on Monday and hear a lot of people talking about all the fun they had on the weekend without me. (laughs) And I'm like, you know, I would have enjoyed going to that movie or going to that game or, you know, going to that birthday party. Kind of hurts, doesn't it? Okay, I'm just being vulnerable here, you know. I've got, I have some, I have some golf buddies, but apparently I'm a little bit on the periphery, you know, because when I play our little, you know, local course there where we live, I get to play with them. But when they go off to really cool golf courses and stuff, I hear about it on Monday. Okay. All right, <clears throat> Jesus never does that to you. He never excludes you. He is always with you. You are never lonely. He is right there. And it's real important because you'll feel lonely this week, someday. During the week, you're going to feel lonely. The guys are going to feel lonely Wednesday night because the women have midweek. Okay. (laughs) So some of them are going to feel lonely. Okay. It's going to be very important when you feel that little tinge of loneliness to, to really to stop and remember, Jesus, I know you're with me. Amen. Thank you so much. Come on. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, not only are you a friend who doesn't have anything else to do tonight, you're the most amazing friend in the world. Amen. You're the most amazing brother wow. awesome. in the world. <clears throat> in First John chapter 2. So here's my goal in this message, is that we will understand like never before how much Jesus loves us. You know, we've sung it since we were children. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But I don't know if you've ever studied out how much he loves you. I never had until this last week, how much he loves me. And I hope we're all getting it right here, that he... He was compelled by his love for us and his love for the Father, certainly. In 1 John chapter 2, and verse 1, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. The righteous one. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus is your advocate. He is there cheering for you. I didn't make the basketball team ever, but I did make the football team. Okay? I played center on the football team. I was... I was slow and 
and fairly heavy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And my dad, bless his heart, came to every game wherever it was. And we played in Polk County and Hillsborough County and Manatee County. And, and my dad was right there. Okay. He came to every game. Jesus is right there in every event of your life. He is right there cheering for you. He's got your back. Your back is all right. He's got it. He is your advocate. Do you realize how much he loves you? I mean, he just so, he just so full of love for you. His love for you is intense. He's just there for you. He's helping you. He's giving you strength. He's, he's providing you with victories. He's putting people in your life to, to strengthen you spiritually and, and just to be a joy to you. He, he put Carmen and I in each other's lives 48 years ago. Amazing. I am so, so blessed. And I tell Carmen, you know, it's, it's here I get to be married to who I believe is the most amazing woman in the world. And every other man is kind of, you know, with whoever, you know. <laughs> I tell her that. That's horrible, I know, but I tell her that. And I, and I ask her often, you know, after she gets all ready to go and we're going somewhere, I say, honey, when you look that last time in the mirror, do you go, boy, Bentley is a blessed man. <laughs> And I don't think she does because she's too humble, but it's true. Okay? So look how, look how God has blessed me with Carmen. And look how he's blessed us with each other. Amen. What an incredible family this is. So sincere and loving and devoted. Amazing. And so the love of Christ compels us. That's his love for us. <clears throat> he lived for us. He died for us. He chose us. He's our brother. He's our shepherd. Amen. He is our advocate. He's our cheering section. <laughs> and so now, to the best of our ability, we want to strive to reciprocate. That's a big word for a Sunday afternoon. I don't really know what it means, but it seems to fit. <laughs> we want to try to love him right back. And so his love for us compels him. And his love for us compels us. Man, that's a relationship right there. Okay. His love compels us to follow him. Compels us to complete his mission, to reach out to his lost family with love, with urgency, with courage. His love compels us to love his followers, to love each other. <clears throat> his love compels us to say no to temptation. His love compels us to be faithful for life. Amen. God bless you.